have you here. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. And I am humbled by your presence tonight. I want to thank you once again for your faithfulness this week. I'll try to take a moment and explain to you a little bit of the significance of what I have on tonight. This is the uh, men's costume of the Seltal that's spelled, spelled T-Z-E-L-T-A-L. The Seltal Oschuk, O-X-C-H-U-C tribe, the Tenehapa dialect of that tribe. Uh, there are 200,000 tonight who, in southern Mexico, who speak the Seltal Oschuk or the Seltal Highland dialect. What I have on tonight represents a little over a year's work for one lady. This is all handmade. Uh, the, uh, the serape uh, is pure wool, 100% wool. The ladies are shepherdesses. They, uh, they each have their little group of 15 or 20 black sheep, and they take them out every day. Take them out uh, uh, in the fields or, or in the woods and uh, take care of those sheep every day. They shear them by hand, some old uh, uh, hand shears that it uh, uh, doesn't take me but a couple of minutes with them that my hands are already cramping and tired. But they shear them by hand, and then they, they card that wool and so on. And then when the ladies take those sheep out, uh, they, they've got a loom that they take, and while they're watching their sheep, they'll uh, flip it around a tree and around their back, and lean back and they, uh, they uh, start work on uh, that loom uh, making these serapes. The, uh, uh, the men's pants, uh, I have another pair of pants under them, but their legs are bare and uh, uh, they're all at an altitude of anywhere from six to 8,000 feet and uh, uh, they, their legs are like rawhide, I want you to know. I mean, uh, being exposed all, all of the time. But uh, these, uh, these, uh, these pants uh, is all needlework, all hand embroidery. The uh, huaraches, the sandals, are handmade. The uh, sole is... Uh, a used rubber tire, guaranteed for 25,000 miles yet. <laughs> and uh, uh, everything is, that I have on is, is handmade. It's all done uh, by the ladies by hand. Now, uh, unless you've been with a tribe of people and been maybe consumed with the fact of getting to know them, being accepted by them, and finding some way to make the message very meaningful and relevant. You may not understand what it means to be uh, accepted into the tribe or, or, or to be given when you come to the place to where I do not know of any other foreigner that uh, has the costume that I have on tonight. I remember in the early 60s in Houston, Texas, meeting and listening to Darlene Rose, who uh, spent 40 odd years in Papua New Guinea and uh, outlived at least two husbands. And she told what it was uh, after World War II, with her second husband, she'd been a prisoner of the Japanese. Her first husband died in a Japanese concentration camp. And uh, when uh, American soldiers discovered a valley of uh, Aboriginal people that uh, no one had ever seen, and they'd never seen anyone from outside, and she and her husband 
moved into that tribe and uh, for a couple of years learning the language and so on. And one night uh, there was a village celebration, a tribal celebration. The drums were going and, and they, uh, they came to the house and uh, asked if she would accompany them. And uh, the, uh, the big thing was the killing of these pigs, these hogs. And uh, as they es escorted her uh, around the bonfire, uh, somebody uh, with some kind of a sharp instrument killed a hog and then uh, went across the stomach of that hog and opened it up and reached in with the warm blood and the fat off the intestines. They began to smear that blood in her hair down the side of her face and uh, her clothing all the way to the tip of her toes. And she began to weep and weep and weep. They began to call her the white mama. And it meant the fact that now she truly was considered a member of their tribe and accepted in that manner. And uh, uh, maybe give you a little idea of the significance of uh, such a costume that are those that I've been wearing this week. Let's go tonight again to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, where there is no vision. Vision. The act of seeing, the ability to see or perceive. Or for a Christian tonight, it's being able to see through the eyes of faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 perhaps would give us a definition of that. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. You know, we have a common saying in English that uh, seeing is believing. Well, I want to tell you that's a fallacy tonight. The Bible teaches if you believe, you'll see. If you will believe, you will uh, you'll see. Vision. It may need to start with you tonight. It may be necessary that it start with you in relationship to victory. It's possible that you have never ever one day in your life as a Christian had victory. That may, be, that may be what you need to appropriate and begin with faith. Or it may be tonight that there's one soul somewhere. It may be even a loved one or mother or father, son or daughter, or, or, or someone that, uh, a colleague at work or something, but someone that God would lay on your heart to believe him far. And it should be normal. It should be natural. Not abnormal, nor subnormal. For God to take you step by step in your life to where he leads you even to things you've never heard of, you've never seen anybody else experience. But a vision, something that God allows just you to begin to get a glimpse of and to see. Acts chapter 13, verse 41, I realize there are other applications of this passage Acts chapter 13 and verse 41 says, Behold, ye despisers and wonders and perish, 
Why work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you? That ye in no wise shall believe. Not something that you might invent or work up or concoct, but that only the Spirit of God can convey. Someone has said, something that's conceived in heaven and birthed on earth in a life of a believer. There are many passages we could use tonight that uh, gives us a little bit of a glimpse there. Maybe 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, Neither in the dreams of man yet. That's not talking about heaven. You take the context of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and you see that it's talking about the Holy Spirit of God and the revelation of the Holy Spirit of God, the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God into the Word of God and His illumination Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, And God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. But why, beyond your wildest dreams, beyond your wildest imaginations, even more than you can appropriate and plead in prayer. God is able. God is able. I want to take you tonight to the jungle of Chiapas in southern Mexico. Maybe it'd be well if we locate the areas that we've been looking at this week. The southernmost state in Mexico is the state of Chiapas, now somewhere around five million people, the size of some countries. The southernmost state there, and uh, this, uh, this map would locate uh, out here in this area, the mountains of the state and where you were introduced to last night. Now tonight we're going to go to the jungle. Over in this area are the dark part of the state. This is uh, the river that separates uh, uh, the country from Guatemala. This also is the border of Guatemala, the country of Guatemala in Central America here. But uh, let's, uh, let's, let me introduce you uh, and, and bring you to up to date tonight on how the jungle was opened. In uh, uh, 1970, in the edge of the mountains in a place called Jericho, and we ended last night with Jericho, and uh, there, the, the present church and all that's involved with that church there, a man walked two days on the trail. That was this man, Juan Hernandez, walked two days on the trail from the jungle and came and asked if we would go to his village of Senso. So uh, I uh, contracted a, it was uh, two days on the trail or, or a 30 minute flight by a bush plane. I 
contracted a bush plane uh, to take me in. And uh, we had uh, about 30, 35 people met together that first night. And I had taken one of the uh, preachers with me. I had to preach in Spanish, and he translated into Celtal. And before I could get to the point of the invitation, there were several men who began to speak up. I wasn't sure if they were about to rise up against me or what was about to happen, but what they were doing were agreeing. And so when the invitation was given, there were 20 odd people that made public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And that was the beginning in the jungle, and it was in this place called Senso. It was a village of about 1,200 people. And uh, in time, this was the congregation there, and then you'll see as it grew. I, uh, I began to see the need, mentioned that fact last night of an airplane. I didn't figure that I was much material to be a pilot, didn't plan on flying. And uh, there was a man from Texas who came as a missionary. He'd been flying for 18 years and uh, had, had a lot of experience. So we were able to, I was able to buy an airplane, and uh, so he was going to fly it. But uh, the first trip into the mountains was going in here to Senso. And uh, he, the Helio Courier was a plane that you, that will fly slow. You have to get it under 55 miles an hour for it to land. If not, it'll just, grasshopper. I mean, it'll hop. It'll go back to the air. It'll fly at 32 miles an hour and is totally maneuverable. Closest thing to helicopter in a fixed wing aircraft, but he couldn't slow it down. And so as he came in, he came in high and hot and he ran out of, ran out an airstrip. And this is what happened on the very first trip. He ran out of, of airstrip and, uh, and uh, did all kinds of damage uh, to the airplane. What an embarrassing thing for me to have to report to my supporting churches. That was a very difficult day. And the attack that Satan brings when there are defeats for the missionaries, especially in something like this, the accusation that the enemy brings are very real. Well, at that time, uh, uh, the gear doubled up, and it did, uh, in 1970, $5,500 worth of damage. And uh, this was 75 miles, well, actually 150 miles from the capital city. The nearest facsimile of a road, 75 miles, I had to fly mechanics in from Mexico City, and here by the side of the airstrip, they took it apart and rebuilt the airplane. And uh, the, the friend that came to help me, he got out and he said, uh, man, I'm sure sorry. And uh, uh, he went out to the capital city with me when I went out to make a report, and I haven't seen him since. I haven't seen him since. He, he took off. He left. Well, I got a Mexican bush pilot to fly it out to another strip that was a little longer, and they, the mechanics finished some more work. Then I couldn't find anybody. Well, I had 25 hours of instruction. I couldn't find anybody. So I soloed illegally off a dirt strip, wasn't finished, couldn't shut the door, had to tie it together with a rope. I didn't have any sense. I didn't know any better. I didn't know you couldn't fly an airplane with the air indicator not working. And I flew it to the capital city and uh, did a little bit more work and got a fair permit. 
And uh, with a student license, never having soloed, I flew it eight hours across Mexico to the U.S. to get the airworthy certificate uh, done on it. But it was rebuilt. And this is how the floorboard came up and so on. I wasn't, I wasn't in it. I was on the ground and uh, watched it as it came in, and I knew exactly what was happening when he came in. But one year later, I couldn't even spell pilot. And then I became one. <laughs> and uh, so this was a year later in the same strip. And God, by his grace, gave me 15 years, some 2,500 hours flying in this area in these mountains. Well, I total one, and I'll show you that in a little bit. <laughs> when you fly in these type of circumstances, dirt strips, the cows and the mules and the turkeys and the dog and people are all over the air strips and you have to come in and drag it once low to get everybody off and uh, uh, it's not unusual for big holes in the air strip and you drop, you drop a wheel into a hole and so boom, you twist it off a gear and it falls. And usually you bend up one. You bend up one, you, you have some kind of an accident about once a year. This was known as the graveyard of Mexico for pilots. And uh, the Lord provided another one, and he did that in a very miraculous manner. But uh, this was the second plane, and landing as well at, at Senso. But uh, when they build, they're not like we are here. When they build, it's, the building's usually full already. And they underbuild rather than overbuild, okay? And so you can see as, as time went by, they grew and they added to their building and the congregation grew and uh, time went by. Uh, this was a missionary that came and, and helped us especially in dropping. For some reason, he could never learn the language. But he helped us to drop the southern half of Mexico with gospel literature. And the, the man, that's a man standing there uh, of the most primitive tribe in Mexico. The men and the women look alike because they all have long hair and they wear the same type of tunic. They are demon worshipers and are polygamous. Take little 10-year-old brides and it's not unusual for a man to have five and six uh, wives. But uh, uh, this, this fellow came uh, when uh, Ed landed there at Senso, taking me in one time, he came to see us. It's, there are only about 300 left, 400 left, of the Lacandon tribe, most primitive tribe in Mexico. Uh, locating where Senso is at on the map, only about 35 miles from the border of Guatemala, deep in the jungle. And uh, again, the, that airplane on the strip there. Well, uh, time came and I didn't know. They asked me to come for a Bible conference. And I'm not sure what this was, 94, somewhere in there. And uh, got there and lo and behold, here was a beautiful concrete rock building. They uh, had a gravel road, 42 miles. Took seven hours to go in on 42 miles on that gravel road. That's the way it still is today. And they, uh, out at the road, they bought the block. And they transported that block in. And they built this building. Now here's a village of 1,200 people, and eventually we're running 750 in services here in Senso. And uh, I, I don't have very good uh, pictures of uh, inside uh, of Senso uh, through the years. Uh, the airstrip is no longer usable, and it's not used anymore, road in. And uh, Bruce came up from Honduras and Daniel from Guatemala this particular time. I said 94, it must have been 89, I'm sorry. 
when uh, they finished this building and in some of the services, uh, there again, they practice segregation. Women sit on one side. Men sit on the other. Brother Juan Gomez, man that I had in classes uh, back in 1975 at the center that the Lord gave in the Bachajon tribe, uh, really built up this church and so on. And uh, went to the river to take a bath one day, and uh, the wind blew a dead tree down and, and killed him and his dog. And uh, uh, his son, I, I, I knew him before the, his son was born, Fidencio, but uh, uh, here in 89 there, Fidencio surrendered to preach in that conference. And uh, he was 16 or 17 years old. He was with me a week before last in the Bible conference. And uh, 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 such a blessing to see how God's used him over the years. And in a moment I'll show you uh, one of the works that he built up uh, in the jungle. Uh, Brother uh, Roman on the left, uh, one of the uh, missionaries in the area. And Mariano, the pastor, uh, now in, uh, in Senso, been, a, been the pastor there now for some 15, 16 years. Now, these conferences are a great time for uh, uh, fellowship and uh, eating together as well, but it's quite a job for the ladies to grind the corn for the tortillas by hand, do all the cooking. They do all the cooking on uh, uh, open fires and so on. But uh, uh, men on one side, the ladies on the other, uh, here in, uh, in Senso. They have five missions today. This is one of their missions in a little place called Tani Perla. And uh, uh, they're a little building, little mission, small group, but uh, are right in the middle of the, uh, 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 the Zapatista guerrilla activity. In fact, in Senso, uh, they're two miles from the, the main uh, training camp of the Zapatista Liberation Army. This, uh, this is a, a guerrilla movement that has disrupted much of southern Mexico. They had to leave the village for 10 months, left their homes and left everything, went to the county seat town, and uh, was a very difficult time. There were some that uh, could not, did not endure. Uh, they run about 450 today, not the 750, but there have been two congregations started in the county seat town by those that remain there. Uh, Cristobal Colon, further over in the jungle, not a large work, but uh, this, they've started a number of congregations, and I think there's a guy here tonight that uh, has been there uh, to Cristobal Cologne, uh, and uh, maybe you'll recognize him somewhere here. Maybe he'll show up. Uh, uh, well, I don't see him. I don't know where he's at. But uh, I need to mention uh, some and their faithfulness. You see what happened here in the jungle? There was no more land in the mountains. And the villages were overpopulated. The government opened up the jungle for colonization in 1968 and 1969. And there was some families from Zapata and then the second congregation in Libertad who went to the jungle to hack out villages totally from scratch and colonize in the jungle. And uh, there was a couple both illiterate. Uh, the mother and father of brother Ernesto Perez, one of the 12 grandsons of the illiterate grandmother that I mentioned last night. But uh, these people went into the jungle and Acts 8 and 4 is true of them. People that were illiterate and yet they gave the testimony 
they witnessed and they reached souls for Jesus Christ. Now, the dear lady is with the Lord today, and uh, this man who was at one time, uh, I mean, he was some specimen of, of, uh, of, uh, of mankind and masculinity, is uh, uh, almost an invalid today. But it was their faithfulness, their faithfulness that established, was responsible for establishing this church, and then this church has started a number of missions there in the jungle. But uh, this is uh, Cristobal Colon. There's that guy. He's, he's trying to hide down there somewhere, right down there. Uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, their son, Brother Ernesto here, who uh, has been faithful as a missionary throughout uh, this area of the jungle. And uh, uh, the little little church of Cristobal Colon. Then uh, uh, from the second congregation in the mountains, Libertad, another group of people, founded the village of Ignacio Allende. They were 42 miles in, nothing but a trail in the jungle. And uh, we tried to find them and couldn't find them. Brother Pedro here tried to find us. He took a train. We were in central Mexico. He took a train to Puebla, a city of a million people. He'd never been in a town before. Couldn't speak much Spanish. Got off the train, and he went walking down the street. And he stopped people on the street. Do you know Milton Martin? Do you know Milton Martin? And for two days on the streets, he tried to find me in the city of Puebla. And he finally gave up and went home weeping, very discouraged. It was perhaps a year later that uh, one of the other men was able to find them. And uh, my first few times in, first time I went part of the way by mule and walked the rest of the way. And I've walked that 42 miles many times into Ignacio Allende. I'm going to be with them week after next for the dedication of another building and probably my last visit in with them. But uh, uh, they hacked out a village in the jungle, and uh, my, uh, they, they like to either kill a hog or a beef or something and make, uh, make the Bible conferences uh, a very exciting time as they, as they work. And uh, 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 in all these congregations. Well, again, you can get back at a distance and look and see as they've grown. Uh, now they have names maybe that uh, you wouldn't understand of their, of their churches. Uh, Independent Baptist Church uh, uh, based, uh, what is it, 2 Timothy 1.19. Uh, hmm, I can't remember in English. Ray del Siglo, uh, Eternal King eternal king or something like that. And then they got some other verses. They, they just make sure they cover it all. And so they put a, put a bunch of other verses across there uh, as well. But uh, this is uh, uh, between services, uh, visiting, uh, fellowshipping together, and so on uh, here in Ignacio Allende in the jungle. Now it's going to be interesting to see uh, their, their building here now in a couple of weeks, their concrete block building, and uh, and so on. Now that uh, is quite a chore, taking corn, uh, soaking it in lime water overnight till it swells up, then running it through a, uh, an old uh, grinder by hand to uh, make the the masa, the meal, and then uh, to make their tortillas, and. Uh, it's quite a chore. Then uh, they kill a hog, butcher it there, prepare it, and uh, but a real time of fellowship as well, not only of instruction in the Word of God, but uh, a real encouragement uh, to believers uh, to come together in this manner. And uh, there's another one of those guys that was uh, uh, in in there. Uh, have been to Ignacio Allende. They uh, 
the uh, use the indigenous instrument, the guitar, and uh, I like to do specials, and, and if you're not careful, they'll sing all day and all night. <laughs> and uh, you try to go to sleep there in that church building, and, and uh, those guys are sitting there playing all night long. <laughs> Brother Nesto, uh, baptizing, a little stream there nearby, we uh, received an invitation, I'm not sure when, 70, 71, from a place called Planda Utla in the jungle. And I, I landed in village after village after village trying to find out where's Planda Utla. And they kept telling me, well, it's the next village. And I landed in the next village, and all they wanted the next village. And uh, so uh, I landed in Planda Utla, and, and uh, when the airplane came in in those days, uh, uh, no road. Uh, these people made the jump from uh, the, the, the mule to the airplane, uh, skipped the automobile. So everybody came out to get the news and see what was going on and so on. And so uh, we uh, uh, were going to have a service. Uh, at a house right on the airstrip, about seven o'clock that night, as we were about to have the service, about 40 men came and would not allow us to have the service. And uh, they uh, threatened to, uh, with their machete knives, to ha hack up the airplane. So we were not able to have a service. We were just uh, uh, able to sit around the table and yet uh, witness, and there were three families, three couples that night that trusted the Lord, and uh, uh, two of those men then went out and spent the night with the airplane to protect it. But uh, they went through for three years, and one of them, Brother Augustine, Brother Cottles here, is praying with him uh, before we were to leave, uh, and uh, giving him some counsel. And here's a man, here's a man, without a pastor, without anyone, for three years withstood uh, tremendous, tremendous persecution. He and his brother Pedro, uh, all alone here in Plan de Utla. But I want you to know, it was worth it. It was worth it. And uh, uh, time went along. They had a building over here. And uh, then they built another building as they grew. And then... Uh, uh, continued to grow. It was the airstrip was right here where the picture is being taken, and as they grew, and uh, uh, still a wooden building, and uh, then the ordination of their pastor, uh, and the congregation waiting that ordination, and then uh, this was what they built in 1997. Now there's a road in, concrete block building, and uh, a large congregation. Uh, and there again, there's those guys again. And uh, 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 here's, here's another congregation with a number of, of missions today. But uh, Plunda Utla, they're, uh, they're building, and as they've grown through the years, and uh, faithfulness, faithfulness is, uh, is, 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 is such an encouragement and such a blessing to see as they continue. Then nearby is a place uh, called uh, Nueva Centro Palestina. This place today has about 400 in attendance and uh, has... Uh, uh, little by little through the years, as you see, here was a second building they had, and then we'll see in a moment uh, their, their present building, another concrete block building. But uh, through the years, a number of men God's raised up there. Uh, they told me the other day they have nine preachers now, nine preachers. And these fellows are out, and I don't know how many, how many missions they're involved with today uh, from uh, Palestina. But uh, let's move on and we'll see if we can find uh, uh, where they get into 
the new building. This young fellow surrendered, preached, and he's 16. He's 32, 34 now, and uh, uh, has just, just gone forward, just continued. I don't know how many works he started. I remember him telling about uh, when he was about 18 or 19, had a mission, he had to walk through the jungle. He was making his way through and heard a javelina hog treat him and uh, kept him up a tree for four or five hours uh, before finally they'd leave and, and let Jorge uh, get down and make his way on. But uh, now they're concrete block building and uh, uh, presently that which they have and uh, uh, their building, which all of these, remember now, they've built 100% themselves. From the very beginning, ownership has been given to them. It's very important psychologically that from the very beginning that a work belong to the people. And when it's theirs, then they'll have that vision yeah. and that burden. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I've got several more pictures here. And oh boy, here we go again. You know, that, uh, that time when they prepare the feast and first time they see themselves uh, in a video camera, Bruce plays it back. And what an experience. But, uh, and they killed a, killed a beef at this particular time. And the guys are butchering and the ladies are preparing that. that. Busilha, this was in the jungle and received an invitation. A letter came inviting us to this place and flew in there. And uh, the village chief lived right there. And uh, he put us up and we had our first services. And I took two of the men with me and and uh, man, I thought, this is really great. This, this is going to be a real opportunity. And I got in the plane, took off, and asked the fellows, what do you think about it? Oh, they say, we can't go there. I said, why? Oh, I said, the village chief, he's got two wives. He's got two wives. He had both of them there. And these guys can pick up on things. It may take the missionary four or five years many times to pick up on. They know their people, and they become men of discernment. It took several years later. Uh, that we were able to continue here. This was uh, in the jungle, and at the time when we began here, the ladies were all topless. No one uh, wore a blouse or anything in that respect. Well, I want you to know, not only the believers have changed, but uh, all the women in the village now are different. And so uh, they moved out to the highway. They built a road nearby. And so they moved out about five miles. And uh, they built a building. And they grew and built another building. And they built another one. And now they have a concrete block building. I'm going to be with them too here week after next. And uh, this was organization day uh, here in, in Busilha. And uh, again, People preparing uh, and uh, uh, meals and so on. Uh, the charter members of Busilha, and uh, then now, this is what they have. Uh, this is what they have, and uh, it may not appear much to you, but when they have paid the price. They've believed God. They've not been mercenaries. In other words, they haven't received that outside help. By faith, they've done it. The respect of others in the village. I was in Honduras uh, about a year ago with Bruce in a Bible conference, and one of the congregations there had the dedication of their building. And all the authorities of the village came for that dedication. And several of them stood and gave testimony of what it meant. What it meant. What those, what, what they'd, as they'd watched those people and uh, what it meant to them, the respect they had to see those people trust God and wait on God for the building 
of their own building. So uh, uh, there's, uh, there's real testimony uh, when, that, uh, when that happens, uh, such as here in Busil Ha. Uh, sorry about that. Several of these pictures of, of the ladies, again, with their preparation. A couple other places in the jungle. Uh, organization, uh, charter members, uh, charter members uh, of a church. And by the way, uh, we're, we're very careful. We take our time in organizing. We, uh, we wait until they can totally govern themselves. That doesn't just mean uh, that they can have, have the insight and so on to take care of some of uh, their, their affairs, but also that they practice discipline. That it isn't necessary for a missionary to come in from outside and confront their problems and, and uh, help them with the, with the uh, counsel and the, the, to discipline someone who's in sin or f- refuses to recon- reconcile with another brother or something in that respect. But uh, they themselves take care of those things. They themselves take care of those things. And it may take 10 or 12 years sometime. But when they do, they are totally an autonomous body in every sense of the word. So uh, these were the charter members. And then uh, here's a place in the jungle. They uh, were poor and they don't have that type of building. But uh, they've proved the maturity as well, a proof of spiritual maturity. No longer babes in Christ. No longer babes in Christ. And we always take a time of special congratulation, of commending them, and it becomes a very moving time many times. Tears and counsel that's given by all of those that go by to... uh, Give them a hand of fellowship. Hold to Leha, uh, another place, in the, another congregation in the jungle, and their time of organization, and they were in their second building. It wasn't finished. All they had was a, a roof up. They didn't have walls up or anything, but that didn't bother them. They were ready to move on, and uh, so it was uh, organization time. Uh, the... Uh, uh, the doctrines of the faith and the church covenant was given and they made, they committed themselves uh, to, uh, to, uh, to that fact. Uh, the reading of the, the charter members of that church and the Pina Limonal man went from Jericho all the way over and uh, started to work there. Very small. Now this, this fellow can uh, is so feeble, continues to preach, and he can't read now. His eyes are so bad, and uh, he doesn't know any Spanish, but uh, he's been faithful since uh, 1970 or 71, where he began over in Jericho. And what a joy to see Brother Pedro a uh, week before last uh, as he came out, came over to the uh, Bible conference there. I mentioned a man that uh, surrendered to preach in Senso. That was Fidencio. And he went uh, as far as you can go in, in the jungle, right to the river with the corner there of the country of Guatemala, and worked here for a year in Florida, Cacao. And this was organization day of the church in Florida, Cacao. Oh, man, jungle, mosquitoes. I've never seen such mosquitoes in my life. It takes two men to go out in the field and work. One guy's with a palm leaf while he's fighting off the mosquitoes. And they take turns then. Uh, the other guy uh, fights off mosquitoes while the other guy works with a machete knife. But uh, Florida Cacao, uh, the organization in 1993 of this work here. And it was, uh, it was Fidencio. Fidencio. Now he's uh, filled out a little bit more. He's married. Here's his wife, baby, and uh, he uh, helps his income some by 
making bread and built an oven. And so for the conference, they baked bread, sweet bread, fresh sweet bread, right out of the oven. And uh, uh, if you try it, Mexican sweet bread. I mean, uh, Santa Rita. Uh, also in the jungle, and uh, work started there. Bruce went in in 1974, showed an open air film uh, and while he was home from college in the summer. And there were a number of professions of faith, and uh, they began to grow. They, uh, they wanted to build an airstrip and wanted, uh, wanted uh, us to come in. And they didn't know quite about the airstrip, so they asked me if I'd come and check it out. And uh, uh, Santa Rita, and uh, this is where they were at after about a year and a half. And uh, I flew in on the 12th of March. They had about 120 yards cut out the jungle. And I didn't like uh, how the air, the plane was responding in the air. And I decided I flew in about 12 o'clock. I decided I'm not going to get try to get out of here. I'll uh, spend the night. Now, I uh, had a couple of preachers with me, Brother Gaspar, who was one of the missionaries. They had people ready to be baptized, so we had a baptismal service that afternoon, a couple of more services. And uh, I, was, uh, I was sleeping on some split logs that they were using for benches in the little church building. In my sleeping bag, at about 5 o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by presence. And there was a suggestion. It was very real, almost as if it was audible. You're alone today. There's nobody thinking about you. You're forgotten. Well, I got up, and at daylight, uh, I went to, uh, cranked up the airplane. Uh, this is the area there. Uh, where I'd been flying. Uh, Brother Gaspar, this, this missionary here, was with me. One of his students was with me, and the rest of these were preachers now uh, here in, in Senso. And uh, right after this picture got in, warmed it up, went down, did the check, I took off in the wind. And I got about 20 feet in the air, and the wind totally changed. Instead of being to the front to give me the lift, the wind was behind me. And I couldn't get any, couldn't get any lift. Not there about 250 yards were mahogany trees. This big around, 120 foot high. Well, that piece of aluminum is not going to make contact and survive trees like that. So a decision had to be made. I began to look, saw a tree about 20 foot high, and they told me, they trained me how that you could set it up, pancake it, drop it right in the top of a tree. Now that's not the way you usually land an airplane. <laughs> of course, you know that all landings are nothing more than controlled crashes. <laughs> but uh, I set it up and I landed in the top of a tree, it did just like they told me. Boom, it sat in the top of the tree. And then it settled. It went down. Jerked the wing off. Had gasoline coming in on my left shoulder. And uh, it got dark. And it went all the way on down. All the vegetation, the vines and all that in that tree, jungle tree, come down and covered us up. Could not be seen from the air. Wing came down. Gasoline coming down. I couldn't open the door. I had to get my back up against the other side of the plane, my feet up against the door, and I finally got it open. But in 30 seconds' time, I wiped out what God's people had paid monthly for for four and a half years. But it began that morning. It began that morning with a demonic presence suggesting the fact that no one was remembering me 
that day. I want to say tonight, your missionaries know when you're praying and they know when you're not. They know when you're not. Let's go just briefly now back to the Word of God. I want to attempt to communicate something to you tonight between the Gospels and the book of Acts. In the Gospels, we find where the Lord, after praying all night, chose 12 men that they might be with Him, His disciples, and later known as apostles, but that term was not used that much in the Gospels. We do find that term being used in the book of Acts. In the Gospels, they were known as disciples. A disciple, disciple is a learner, or one that submits himself to the discipline of another. The word apostle, of course a biblical apostle was one from the days of the baptism of John through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, those were and are scriptural apostles. But also the word apostle means sent one. Sent one. Now, when you consider in the Gospels those disciples that spent three and a half years with our Lord, you see, you see a number of characteristics. They were very, very weak men. You'll find that the Scripture speaks of them doubting the Lord, reasoning, trying to reason things out many times, suggesting the fact that uh, they really didn't accept what he had. Also, we find that they had a real difficulty in understanding. They did not understand many times as he taught and as he took the Old Testament Scriptures and dealt with the, the fact how that it was, was going to be necessary, he'd come to die. He'd come to pay the price for sin. They had a problem understanding that. They were very slow to believe. Our Lord rebuked them many times, not because they were low in IQ. He didn't rebuke them because of their ignorance. He rebuked them for their little faith. O ye of little faith was a term that was used many times with them. Their motives were incorrect. James and John, and there are passages of Scripture that deal with these, but for time's sake I'll not give them. James and John, uh, even uh, 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 after he revealed the fact that there were some going to betray him, they asked, they came and asked if one couldn't be on the right hand and one on the left. They behaved like little children. That night, they could not even watch and pray an hour with him. Grown men couldn't stay awake and watch and pray with our Lord Jesus Christ. They were very fearful even after the resurrection. They met in secret for fear of the Jews. They were very impulsive and presumptuous men. But then we find something happened. Something happened. And then we find, well, our Lord told them in John chapter 20 and verse 21, He said, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you, a true apostle. In Luke chapter 24, verses 31 and 32, the scripture says, after those two disciples on the road to Emmaus had had some time with the Lord, it says, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures? But you'll notice the first thing that happened. Their eyes were opened. There was something that happened to them from the Gospels to the book of Acts where they truly became sent ones. 
You'll notice one thing was the resurrection. You know, if you'll notice all of the messages in the book of Acts, you'll find they always included the resurrection. They always mentioned the resurrection. The second thing that you'll find was that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit became very real to them. It said in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32 of these men, uh, and note, note the testimony, and uh, I will take the time and ask you to take the time to turn to there in Acts chapter 4 and in verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. They weren't the same. And then uh, they couldn't shut them up. There was a holy boldness in these men. And when they were ordered to hush, to be quiet, to shut their mouths, their answer was in Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. Then you find when the persecution came in Jerusalem, what was said about them? They went everywhere preaching the Word. In Acts chapter 17, when they arrived in one place, the news was, though these that have turned the world upside down have come here now. And I'm wondering tonight, could it be we have a lack of vision tonight? Could it be we find ourselves in the same place of those disciples? Could it be tonight that the description and the characteristics in their lives might possibly be a description of our lives tonight? Are, are we sent ones? Are, the, are we those with a holy boldness tonight and we cannot keep quiet of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done with us? You know, there's no way tonight you can have a soul-shattering experience with Jesus Christ and ever be the same again. There's no way. Jeremiah 16, uh, 15 and 16 says, You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Now, that's not just some special Christians. The Lord assumed, He spoke in that passage as if it was the normal experience of every believer. And then he said in Acts 1.8, And ye shall be witnesses unto me. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto, unto me, both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the earth. Maybe tonight we need to be honest and see which we are. A disciple, like those in the book of, uh, in the Gospels, or now, like those men in the book of Acts. It is normal and natural for every believer to bear fruit. If you are not bearing fruit tonight, the Bible says, by their fruits ye shall know them. Could you prove tonight that you're a believer in Jesus Christ? by fruit that you've born. Someone you won to Christ. If not, what's the reason why we're not bearing fruit? Number one is, there has to be a relationship. There has to be union 
before we can procreate, bring forth children. Or there's some impediment. There's something that hinders us from having children. Spiritually, it may be tonight that you simply do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Because you see, like produces like always. You don't have a relationship with Him. You're not in union with Christ. You don't know Him. Or secondly, there's some impediment tonight. Now, I'm going to beg you for your own sake, for your future, for the future of your family and your children and your grandchildren. Would you tonight examine yourself before God? Forget, forget about what you've seen and been exposed to, what uh, traditionally you've seen. Did you know that uh, shepherds don't have sheep? They don't give birth to sheep. Sheep give birth to sheep. The place of the shepherd is to meet the needs of the sheep in such a manner, care for the sheep in such a manner, feed and, 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 uh, and uh, help in, in their care and healing and, and, and all those things that are involved so that they can reproduce themselves. Christians producing more Christians. Preachers producing more preachers. And let me say this to you tonight, church. You have started other churches. Real proof of your maturity and your spirituality tonight, though, is not the size of your building or church plant, size of your membership or those in attendance, or what your offerings may be. The real proof. Lehigh Valley Baptist Church, are you reproducing yourself? How many churches tonight? How many churches tonight? I was in Mexico preaching a conference, mission conference in a church and a school of missions in the morning in July, a city of about 600,000. The church that I was with was starting five other churches in the city alone, not counting throughout that state. That's supposed to be normal. That's supposed to be normal. Lehigh Valley, you've started other churches, but are you continuing to reproduce yourself? Would you stand? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Would you stand? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just for a moment, quietly, carefully, would you allow God's Spirit just now tonight? Then would you be honest with yourself?